So welcome everyone to my presentation. I know it's late in the day for a lot of you, so I appreciate you sticking around to hear about our spacecraft power analysis in Fortran. My name is Sarah Tipper. I'm a computer scientist at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I work out of Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. And I'm part of a team that both writes and runs to share this work with you today as an example of Fortran being applied to solve engineering problems. Problem. Need to be a when it comes to power systems, because here on Earth, when we plug our electronic devices into the wall, we don't usually question whether we'll have access to the power that they need to work. Well, in space, it's another matter entirely. For our spaceflight vehicles, power is a vital and limited commodity. So here you can see a simplified model of a spacecraft power system using solar arrays power generation and batteries for energy storage. So the focus of the whole system is powering the electrical wheels as there are things that need to be continuously powered on a spacecraft, such as heaters, instruments, and then of course the life support systems that keep the vehicle operational and the crew members alive. So in a perfect world, the solar arrays here, we point it directly to the sun, which would generate the maximum amount of power possible and allow for quick recharging of the base, while also providing enough power to support the important electrical loads. So keeping the batteries adequately charged is a necessity because the spacecraft is not always in view of the sun. And in fact, um, sometimes okay. enters an eclipse Sorry, Sarah. when a planetary body comes between the sun and the spacecraft. Sorry to interrupt. But the sound is rather, rather bad. The sound quality. Oh, okay. Um, hold on one second. I will um, see what I can do about that. I'm connecting to a different network. Yeah, so so far it's still okay. If you Can you speak? She said that that could be the connection uh, rather than the mic. Yes, um, unfortunately this, this year we don't have the, the call in function. Um, the only thing I could offer is that someone of us will share the screen so that the bandwidth is reduced. Doesn't help if it's the latency, but uh, at least bandwidth could be reduced by someone else sharing the screen. And let's wait a minute. Okay, so since Sarah is probably changing network and has to log in again, I will stop the sharing and prepare the presentation here. Is my audio quality better now? Yeah, now it's much better. Okay. 
I had to move rooms. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, no problem. I thought that was my laptop, that was the, my laptop. Uh, the whole day, <laughs> but yeah, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, now, now it works uh, perfect. Thank you. Yes. So, yeah. sorry, I okay. terminated the, the screen share. Yes, I am bringing it back up. Share screen. Okay. Yes, I can see your screen. Thank you. Great. I'm trying to move. There we go. Okay, so I'm not sure how much everyone got before, but basically the spacecraft power system, the electrical loads are very important. And that's because it's powering things like the life support system for the astronauts. So the power management and distribution from the solar arrays to the batteries is a very important part of the, the whole spacecraft um, subsystem. So we need the solar arrays during the day to recharge the batteries so that during the nighttime when or the eclipse period when the bad when the solar arrays are not seeing the sun then the batteries are able to provide continuous power to the spacecraft electrical loads so this is a huge problem that has many complicated um, parameters that go into it so for us that is why our fortran program space comes in it stands for the System Power Analysis for Capability Evaluation, and it's used to predict the performance of a space-based power system. In other words, it can determine whether the solar arrays, given all of the different factors that affect them, can produce enough power in a given scenario to support both the spacecraft electrical loads that must be powered at all times, as well as the batteries that will get the spacecraft through scenarios where the arrays don't see the sun. So, not only is space an extremely detailed model for a highly complicated problem, but it is also much more accurate than the spreadsheet alternatives and has been validated with actual space system, spacecraft power system data. So that's data that we've retrieved from the International Space Station that, that helps us know that our code is, is working correctly and, and doing great modeling work. So the history of space, uh, space is a program that got its start over 30 years ago when it began development to verify and validate uh, some contractor power system calculations for what was at that time space station freedom. And five years later than that, it evolved into the primary tool used to model and guide the selection of and actually the final design of the electrical power system at the International Space Station. So space was used to do some trade studies on you know, which power systems designs from the, uh, the initial submitted ideas would be the best one for the station. And you can see in the bottom image here, the, the design that the space station has today. And those were things that we looked at back then. So after continuing work on analyzing the, the International Space Station, the code earned the NASA Software of the Year Award runner up and one of my most prized possessions in my office, which I'd show you if I was in my office and on video, is a commemorative mug that celebrates this event that I was given as part of my initiation to the team. So that's always an exciting thing for us. And although we didn't slow down after earning these accolades, and instead we've had space under steady development since that time. And we've got two versions of the codes that are in use today. So the first version is what we refer to as Space ISS, or Space for the International Space Station. We use this Fortran code to analyze the electrical power system of the International Space Station ahead of any activities that plan to place the solar arrays in positions where they are not tracking the sun. So that's like during spacewalks or when visiting vehicles approach and dock. The second version of space that we have is called Space the Next Generation, or Space TNG for short you can tell that maybe a few of us are Star Trek fans. So uh, this version of space is a more generalized version of the code that we use to model the electrical power systems of the vehicles that are part of NASA's Artemis program, which will be taking humans to the moon 
moon on Orion and then establishing a lunar gateway in orbit around it. So as you might guess, all of these vehicles are very different from one another, which makes modeling that much more of a challenge, but it's one that we've demonstrated that space is more than capable of overcoming. So for some of the analyses that we have used the space program for, we have looked at um, evaluating the ability of the electrical power system on the space station to support operations during events like uh, right here. This is the installation of the rollout solar arrays in front of the legacy or older solar arrays on the space station that took place earlier this year. So for events like this, you don't want your solar array up here spinning around tracking the sun and, you know, whacking the astronauts on the head while they're working. That's not good. So you have to point it not at the sun. And that's something that we need to take into account when we're determining whether the levels in the batteries are good enough. So we do the same sort of thing when vehicles visit, like this Northrop Grumman Cygnus vehicle below here, where the vehicles actually produce thruster plumes, which can, if they hit the solar arrays, start degrading the, the solar cells and have them produce less power. So we have to lock the arrays to make sure that they're not being hit by those thruster plumes, which means, of course, less power and more analysis work for us. So for the vehicles that are not yet in flight, we have Orion, where we've been doing trade studies where we compare the different spacecraft attitudes or where they, where the spacecraft is oriented in relation to Earth while it goes through low Earth orbit phases of the mission. And this sort of allows the mission planners to select a, a good plan for power for the mission. And for the power and propulsion element that will be part of Gateway by the Moon, we've also worked on predicting the solar array and power system performance over the mission life. So this allows us to determine whether the spacecraft as designed will continue to meet mission requirements from the present and into the future. When it comes to the program space itself, we have hundreds of subroutines that are driven by our many data files. With three different spacecrafts that we're looking at at the moment, you can imagine that we have our own set of parameters defined within data files for each of these vehicles. Information like solar cell properties, the length and resistances of wiring, and also what the spacecraft's geometry looks like so that we can know how the spacecraft shadows itself and during uh, a mission. So all of this work has been performed over the past three decades by over 80 total code contributors and some of whom uh, have been on the team since the very beginning. Hi, Jeff. And some who are students from various schools and universities who have worked on summer projects to improve the code. And throughout this time, we've published more than 26 papers, and I'm sure we'll have more to go as we continue to use space for new and exciting applications. The development environment for space has, um, over the years, changed, as you might imagine. So we started out on Apollo workstations, followed by Silicon Graphics workstations, and eventually moved on to Linux workstations. Eight years ago, we transitioned to Linux virtual machines, which is what we're using today. And we're currently running on the CentOS 7 operating system. So that system's end of life is rapidly approaching. And we're now in the process of preparing to transfer over to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 soon. And on our system, we have access to the various programming languages. We're currently using the AppSoft Fortran compiler, although we are looking into using different ones going forward. We manage our analysis data by saving it to common data format files using the Fortran API. This is something that was developed at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center um, that um, allows us to store our data in a binary format so it's not taking up so much room on our hard drives. So for version, for, um, version control, we're using some internally developed support scripts, but we're transitioning to using Git and GitLab to aid in collaboration. And then with all of the data that we have, we display it through plots and vehicle animations. So um, the code itself is organized into several sections with the main ones being the orbital mechanics, the solar array shadowing, and then the power management and distribution areas. 
So the code can calculate orbital conditions given appropriate program inputs, and then it marches through time to perform necessary power calculations using the spacecraft position relative to planetary bodies, as well as the configurations that are specific to the vehicle, like where the solar arrays are pointing, how old they are, um, all of the things like that that can affect the power generation. So then once we have how the sun is looking at the solar arrays on the vehicle, then we can look at the shadowing as well, because that takes into account the spacecraft geometry here, as well as where it's pointed and the wiring in the solar cells. Because if you shadow something here, maybe you're taking out a whole line of solar cells that, that make it not work. But maybe right here, you're only taking out a couple of solar cells and the rest of them here would work. So we have to track those things because it can negatively affect the power generation of the solar array. And so this is all done through an through iterative calculations on the power system model to reach an energy balance where we can see that the batteries are recharging appropriately. And at the end, we output all kinds of data from the power system capability to the states of the different components, as well as um, different plots and videos. This displays one example of one of the spacecraft, and we're able to look at this marching through time to see what the shadow patterns look like. So we have lots of exciting different ways to analyze these spacecraft power systems, thanks to the, the Fortran. When it comes to using the program, it's as simple as setting up a nameless input file, and then we call a Perl wrapper program from the command line. And this Perl launcher processes any options or arguments and then calls space, which displays the analysis information to the screen on the console while it runs to give the analyst a preview of what to expect from the results. So once the analysis is completed, then the output files and plots are generated and available for review. And at this time, the entire program is actually driven from the command line in Linux, and it has no graphical interface. So this is something that the analysts in our group are used to using. And, and we haven't had problems with, but um, there may be different plans in the future. So before I talk about our current and future development efforts, I wanted to touch on a question that we are frequently asked by people outside of our project teams. And it sounds like uh, some of the other presenters during the conference alluded to the same thing today. Uh, whereas we get asked, why are you using Fortran? Uh, People understand why we may have started using Fortran back in 1988 when development began, but these days we get frequently challenged on its relevance. Uh, so I don't need to go into depth for everyone here, since if we didn't love Fortran, we wouldn't be at this conference. But our favorite lines of defense are those we've listed here. So we found that Fortran is easy to pick up for students or engineers who have little to no experience, whether with programming in general or with Fortran in specific. And the execution speed is unparalleled, as noted by this friendly robot here. And the fact that we have an active ISO standards board for Fortran means that we can look forward to new features and improvements in the language. So those are often picked up by open source and free compilers, which are under active development, which gives us the stability that we're looking for in a language. And of course, there's the whole issue with money. So there's a lot of people who suggest we might want to switch our model over to MATLAB. But at that point, we point out the cost benefits of needing only a compiler versus numerous MATLAB expensive licenses. So um, instead of looking to change languages in the future, we're instead looking to modernize much of our code. For while a lot of the code base is still written in Fortran 77 or Fortran 90, we've been moving over the last few years to using modules and object-oriented programming techniques in addition to switching from fixed form to free form format as we create new routines and when we make significant modifications to old ones. And since many of our routines are also reliant on common block variables at the moment, which was also mentioned earlier, uh, we're aiming to transition these to modules in the near future. So another effort that we've had a heavy focus on lately is improving our code portability. Um, and we're looking to expand the environments in which the code runs. To that end, we've been moving away from compiler-specific functions and moving towards standard Fortran intrinsic functions and modules as much as we can. 
Along with portability, we're also always looking at increasing our code's robustness and its ability to reduce potential errors. So future project plans include introducing unit testing on top of the internally written testing routines that we currently use. We've been looking at PF unit as a framework to introduce testing to our new modules and routines, and we're excited to see what this addition can bring to our pipeline. So we're also looking to get space working with both G4Tran and the Intel compilers not only to increase the portability, but to be able to catch more issues via warnings. And all of these modernization efforts will be culminating soon with the development of a graphical user interface for the code, which we're developing in PyQt and Python that will allow us to share our Fortran code with customers who want to use it for electrical power system analysis on their own machines, but they are not too excited about the command line interface. So in conclusion, I hope that you now know a bit more about power system analysis and why it's vital for the success of spaceflight missions and how Fortran and space has made this possible for the last few decades. Our team is excited to be leveraging more modern Fortran features going forward to continually improve the space code and we're looking forward to launching space into the future of spaceflight and the pun is very much intended. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge all of these contributors uh, who have supported the development in some way over the years. And I'd like to thank everyone who is listening this evening or afternoon. And thank you for your attention today. Sorry for the technical hiccups. If there are any questions, either I or my colleagues will be happy to answer them here or in the chat. Thank you. Cool. Thanks cool. Uh, for the thank presentation. I see there is a comment in the chat, but yeah, I'm afraid that uh, we are a little bit uh, running out of time and we don't have uh, too much time uh, for questions, unless okay. that, is a, that is a quick one. If not, uh, Slack will be available, well, uh, like <laughs> the rest of today and tomorrow. So uh, I think you can, uh, yes, uh, keep the discussion going. I'm not sure if the organizers uh, want, want okay. to say uh, anything before closing there the... Is, there, is, um, there is one question. I think we, we should have time for, for one question. Um, so it's it's Harvey. Um, Harvey, do we want to repeat it directly or...? Okay, so Harvey asks, um, he was wondering how old most of the space related software is, and if there is any fear in updating software that, that may just work. So for the routines themselves, they kind of vary in age. Space has very much been a program that has um, morphed and developed over time. It's not sort of something that we created uh, 30 years ago and it hasn't changed over the years. So a lot of the routines are continually touched and the, the software that it depends on is um, continuously updated. So it's more updating how the, the routines themselves interact with each other, as opposed to updating um, the entirety of the code at once. So as we add new capabilities to it, we're making sure that those capabilities are utilizing modern Fortran features and making sure with lots of testing that that doesn't break other parts of the code. I, I hope that makes sense. I think it does. And maybe the last question here um, from Marshall and then we close the session for today. Um, it's about um, aerospace software and, and basically restrictions you have, regulatory restrictions you have due to safety concerns and uh, whether your software also has this kind of like formal requirements and whether or not Fortran kind of like can better accommodate those than, than maybe other um, programming environments. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. At NASA, we actually have a lot of different standards that apply to things like software development and, and simulations and modeling. And so those are guidelines that we do have to follow. And those are things that we review from time to time as updates occur. So we're currently going through a, a review of how our code meets the requirements for software safety and compliance with, with different um, 
the different requirements that come in as far as cybersecurity or um, kind of that you're doing enough testing and that um, there are no hazards that will be introduced due to the way that you run and operate your code. So that's definitely something that we have a lot of regulations for and that we do our best to comply with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 